Okay, moving along. So the overlap of two plane waves can result in interference patterns. So here I have a plane wave, here I have a plane wave, and if I just overlap the drawings as you can see them here, you can see I already see some sort of pattern forming here. It's a little bit more complex than an optical system. And you can see a more complex version here where let's say I have two point sources here. So here's a point source, here's a point source, and they're emitting out these radial plane waves. And I want to look at it in the distance and try to find out where they are overlapping. Well, if you basically looked at it in one plane and you had different wavelengths and point separations, you can see you can get even very, very complex patterns where you get interference constructive and destructive as well. And next week we'll talk about diffraction, which results in optical interference that can build up even images as well. And so this little uh, um, optical keyboard is projected by this component here and also senses where your fingers are. And the reason how they can take a laser and project it onto a keyboard pattern is using diffraction, which is a form of optical interference. Again, we'll talk more about that next week. So let's talk about interferometry, which is the main goal of this week. Interferometry typically involves splitting a laser beam, which is a coherent source with all the plane waves in, 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 um, lined up, and then bringing the beams back together to produce interference fringes. And so if I had split the laser into two beams and recombined them like this, where one was 180 degrees out of phase with the other, then I would see red here, red over here, and then where the laser was overlapping and out of phase, in between I would see black in the middle. Look at this example too where I, I bring the beams back together. Anywhere where I see the E-fields overlapping, I would see an intensity maximum. Okay, so I'd see red there. If I go further out of phase and off axis when I bring them back together, I could see multiple points here. If I put a white card here and observe this, I could see multiple points where you get intensity maximas, and in between I would see intensity minimas where it would look dark. And again, if they can move further off axis with respect to each other, you could see that these fringes get closer and closer. So if I want to see fringes spread apart, I need to have the, these beams lined up better and better. And so what we'll do this week is you'll place a piece of paper in the region of interference and you'll observe fringes, just like we showed above, where I've got a laser coming this way and a laser coming this way, and as I bring them really closely together and lined up well, I'll start to see these fringes appear. There's a couple type of interferometers. There's a Mach Zender, where I take the light through what's called a beam splitter. It's basically a special piece of glass with coating such that 50% of the light is this way, the other 50% of the light is partially reflected this way. You have two mirrors, it comes back to another beam splitter, and then half of this light goes through, half goes this way, half of this light goes this, half this way, and you get two beams which you can interfere. There's also a Sagnac interferometer. In this lab, we're going to do the Michelson interferometer. Your light intensity comes in, this is the beam splitter, 50% goes to this mirror and back through, and you get 50% of that, which is 25% this way. A portion of this is again split this way. You had a portion go this way, comes back off the mirror, a portion comes this way, and a portion this way. The point is, is that you get these two beams here where you can put the white card and look for interference if the path length changes at all between these mirrors or they're not lined up appropriately. And so, for example, as I mentioned, I could change the distance of the mirrors here to get interference, or I could rotate them such that they're no longer perfectly lined up, and that could cause interference as well as the light tries to come back in the system. So, the system we're going to use in the lab will look pretty much like this. Here's our helium neon source. You get to make a beam expander again. I promised you, you get to make lots of beam expanders in this lab. And so you're going to get better and better at that. You'll take your exp beam expanded beam. You'll either use a beam splitter disc or a beam splitter cube. In this case, I show it as a cube. There's two types. You'll have two mirrors, and you'll have your white card. And so if I start with a, my intensity of my beam being 1, then it hits the beam splitter, and I get 50% this way, right? 50% back off the mirror. And of that 50%, 50% of that is then shot back to the laser, and it goes other than the 50% of 50% also goes onto the white card. 
And remember, when you do optical systems, everything should reverse itself. So when you set the system up right, the 50% here that then gets cut in half again, the 25% and 25%, that 25% coming back through the system should go right back into the laser. It should reverse through this system back into the laser. And that's when you know you have this mirror lined up. Because think about this. This is going to be really well lined up to produce just a couple fringes. Same thing here. 100% intensity goes through. 50% also got through it off the mirror 50% of which half of that 25% goes to the white card 25% back to the laser again it should reverse back here else you don't have this set up correctly and then at the white card if you do this right and you get these nice and flat and lined up in distance you'll start to see fringes so if everything was perfectly flat for the blue versus the red path lengths I show here Again, this is the same laser light. I'm just drawing them different colors because they're different path lengths. And the red path length was one half wavelength in distance compared to the blue. What would I see at the white card? Well, then everything would be perfectly out of phase, and you would see black at the card. You would see no light. But could you get that in the lab this week? And the answer is no. The mirrors and the optics are not perfect. If I want to get only five fringes per centimeter, which is tough to do, then if you think about the wavelength of light we have in the lab, which is 633 nanometers, five fringes would go through that five times, right? Where you go from peak to valley, peak to valley, peak to valley. That would be five times the wavelength would be a three micron tilt in the mirror or non-flatness. Only three micrometers flatness have these things lined up that well. So it's pretty amazing that this week you're going to build a nano sensor this week where one fringe moves, that's only 300 nanometers distance. And you can do it if you follow the tips I mentioned of, of having good optical alignment and reversing everything back and then carefully adjusting the mirrors at that point to try to get your interference fringes. This will be so sensitive that you'll see even the heat off your finger if you place it near one of these beams will cause fringes to appear by changing the refractive index of air. Now air has a refractive index close to one, but it's not exactly one. And so if you make it a little bit hotter, the gas molecules space out and the refractive index drops. And the light travels faster, seeing a, seeing a shorter optical path length there. And so for example, for these path lengths, wavelength is wavelength of light in, in vacuum divided by refractive index. In this lab, half wavelength, I need to shift by 316 nanometers to get interference. If I'm trying to heat air over 101 centimeter distance with my finger, then that would be over 30,000 half wavelengths. And so how much do I need to change by then, if I, if I put it back into this equation? Then my change in refractive index would be 1 over that 30,000. This is the change in refractive index you see, need, which is tiny. And so you'll do things like using your finger, but you'll also put a soldering iron in there, and you'll see a significant change in the diffraction pattern here as the air heats up in one of these arms. So at this point, do a bit of review, take a break, and we'll keep moving along with this lecture.